No, you, you did it right. Okay. Lastly, he's actually a principal solution architect and lead for a big data on the cloud. Sounds very interesting. And <laughs> he's actually going to be talking about us about large scale streaming analytics using cloud services, cloud based management. So if you can just go ahead, it's all yours, Jay. All right. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks for introduction. So thank you, folks, for stopping by. You know, Toward the end of the day and sticking around to listen to this uh, session. Uh, my name is Jay Palaniapin, um, and I'm a principal solutions architect focusing on cloud and big data. Right? I work for a company called Agilisium. Um, Agilisium focuses on building um, cloud-based solutions for, for our customers, primarily on AWS, and a little bit on GCP and Azure. Um, today, the topic is large-scale streaming analytics on AWS. Right? Um, so why are we talking about this topic? Um, and first, like, I just want to give you a little bit of introduction about what streaming data is and, you know, in order to wield this data, what it might take. Um, usually, when you use apps um, or when you use your smart devices at home, um, behind the screens, there is a lot of, go a lot of things going on, right? So um, the, the app companies and the, and the device companies are collecting your behavior. Right, collecting events of what's going on, you know, which app you're opening, you know, what page you're going to, what buttons you're clicking, you know, what devices you're using, and so forth. Right? Um, these are kind of ingested in real time um, by the, by the different organizations, and they kind of try to make sense of what you're doing. Right? Um, both in near real time, so that they can kind of give you. Uh, recommendations and help in, uh, in terms of what do you want to do next, and also do large-scale analytics down the stream, right? Um, so when we say like large-scale, what what does what does that mean? So a typical large-scale um, streaming analytics I would consider is something like you're ingesting at a rate of um, 10 Mbps, which comes around like one terabyte of data per day, to like hundreds of terabytes, even petabytes a day. Right? This, this is pretty large data. Um, and if you want to wield this data, if you want to like, take that data, ingest it, and store it, it kind of gives a unique um, set of problems. Right? So um, the challenges are you know, performance. So how do I build a system that is performant enough to ingest this, this kind of data, store that kind of volume that's coming in? Right? Um, how am I going to scale this out if, if my application or the systems that I'm building kind of blows up and people start using it more and I start to receive more data? How am I going to handle that? And scalability is a, is, is, is a challenge, right? Uh, reliability is a challenge. So when you're, when you're ingesting that data and you're trying to um, you know, build, build a reliable system for planning for your outage, planning for uh, your data center issues and so forth, how do I build a system that is reliable that does not fall on, on the sides like you know when, when things are getting tough uh, or something that is unpredictable happens so it's, it's, it's a big challenge right on top of that an operational overhead right so when, you, when I'm bu building a complex systems um, the amount of people and and the resources that it requires to build and sustain that system is, is pretty large right so um, if you build your own solutions, like usually a large-scale st streaming analytics, and you're, when you're talking about building your own solutions, it usually means I'm building a an Hadoop-based um, like a solution or a big database solution, right? Um, especially around um, Kafka, Spark, Flink, and so forth. So if I if I build a, a solution like you know on my own, either on a cloud infrastructure as a service or on a um, your data center services, so you need to plan to procure your, your infrastructure, right? That, that in itself is a process, and people who have worked on data centers know that really, really well. 
uh, and it is time consuming, right? Um, in, in a data center, in order to like procure a set of hardware for your needs, especially such a large need, it's, it's a month long process. Um, and even if you, if you do all of that, um, for you to like set up networking, set up proper um, security patches, and related like you know, support services, and even afterwards, like in up and running, the amount of operational overhead is really, really heavy. So um, when, you, when you deal with really large scale streaming analytics, it's, it's, it's almost a no brainer that you, you would go for a cloud-based solution, right? In this in day and age, where um, the anxiety about cloud services, the security related things and their capabilities are proven, people started to like, you know, come into more and more cloud-based services when they wanted to um, ingest and process streaming analytics or any large big data uh, solutions for that matter. Um, so why? We, we're gonna talk about why cloud-based services makes more sense, right? Um, first and foremost, they are turnkey, you know. If I want to build um, a, a streaming ingestion pipeline, so all I need to do is just right-click or go to a quick launch, uh, if, you are, if you are familiar with AWS Quick Launch, I can just, with the click of a few buttons, I'm able to create this pipeline, right? It's, it's really, really powerful. I don't need a ton of engineers to build and run these services, right? And it's highly scalable. So um, most of these cloud providers have multiple uh, data centers within themselves. In AWS world, it's called availability zones. And they have provisioned enough capacity within those, those regions and availability zones that you can easily scale out and scale in as you need. Um, you don't have to plan for it, just you need it. You dial the knob and then you get the scalability that you want, right? And highly available. So again, um, those lot of your data center wor workloads and concerns are taken care of by these, these cloud providers so that you're not worrying about it. So um, most of these services are um, deployed in multiple availability zones, multiple data centers, so you get a really high SLA, something around 99% or 99.99% or more in certain cases, right? Um, on top of that, you also get variety. So what do I mean by variety? Um, if you're building your own solution, right, you may be thinking about um, one single platform or a service that you decide that that's, that's gonna be the right fit for the solution that I'm gonna build. But you always know that you know, I may have made a, like an incorrect choice or my requirements change as I, when I start to build my solution, right? Um, if you are using a cloud-based um, you know, platform, it gives you variety. If I, if I don't want to choose X, I can choose Y, right? It, uh, out of the box, you provide multiple set of services that, that allows you to do a certain thing. Um, I'll kind of showcase what, what do I mean a little bit later in a couple of slides, but the idea is that you get more choices in terms of services that you want to use. Um, and support. Um, you know, AWS or doesn't matter who you go with, they provide a first class support in terms of like enterprise support or business support based on, based on your need and, and your, your budget, right? So you can ch choose the level of support um, provided by experts that, that are ready to serve you when you need it. Um, you're not tied by you know, building your own support model within, within your organization for that, right? And cost effective. So <laughs> I put an asterisk at the end uh, of cost effective. The reason is if you design your solution right, it's gonna be cost effective. However, you know, uh, cloud capacity comes with cost. So if you're not planning it right, you'll end up paying more. So if you're designing it right, it's gonna be a cost effective solution. Right, so um, here I'm just kind of giving you an overview of like, the, the variety of services that's available for you for managing your um, your data and analytics platform within AWS ecosystem. Right, um, and so at the top, like we are talking about the typical um, steps that you, uh, and a data goes through during during its life cycle. So from ingest, where you just capture the data. Through various from various sources, and then you transform it based on your need, and you store it, and then you an analyze it. So, all, for all these phases, you get variety of tools 
and services that, that allows you to um, pick and choose based on your need, right? So some cases, choice is not a great thing, but I believe uh, in this case, it, it is a good thing. So because not all business have same problems, the problems comes in di different, um, different shapes and sizes. So based on your needs and your SLAs, you can pick and choose these platforms and services and build your solution as you need it, right? Um, so I'm just gonna talk about each of one of those uh, pillars here, um, just to get an understanding of how a life cycle of a, of a, a streaming um, pipeline looks like. Um, and then like, you know, we'll, we'll talk about a reference architecture that, that we kinda like sh showcase out of the box that may fit like 80% of the use cases and we can discuss about that more, more a little bit. So when it comes to, come to ingest, um, fr from a streaming perspective, you basically have three set of services within AWS ecosystem, right? Um, Kinesis Streams uh, is the oldest um, and, the, and the most um, robust uh, service that's out there in terms of um, the variety that it provides um, vary to which endpoints you can plug into, to which service it supports. Not only it is supported by first class services, but it's also supported by a lot of um, open source tools and third party services like Hortonworks, Cloudera, um, Databricks and so forth. They're like it's a pretty popular um, ingestion platform for streaming um, data sets, right? Um, and the second is Kafka. Kafka is an open source, um, you know, st uh, streaming buffer, uh, like in a solution. Um, recently, AWS took the open source version of it and built a managed services around it. So you get the, get the SLAs, the high availability, the reliability of, of running something on a cloud platform and not also get the, um, the open source nature of Kafka, right? So it's a new service. Um, and the third one is Firehose, um, which is a version of Kinesis where if you're not worried about, okay, um, the variety or, or the versatility that um, Kinesis Streams provides, you, know, you say, I'm just gonna you know, pour my uh, streaming data into a particular destination. It could be something like an S3 or Redshift or Elasticsearch. You, t you can take the route of Firehose, right? Um, and so basically you interact with these three um, you know, services using the SDKs or agents or third-party services, right? So SDKs are, are an APIs that, that the, um, these services provides where you can directly pump data into these services. Um, Agent-based or something like you know, um, a log stash or a, uh, a log processing um, mechanism where you use a collector-based uh, approach to collect the, your streaming data that is coming in and then buffer it in a, in a local system and push it into Kinesis Streams um, or, or through other services, right? And third-party services, uh, they're becoming very, very popular um, these days. Um, for example, Segment or Mixed Panel or MParticle. Um, these are third-party services which allows you to capture um, you know, real-time data, especially the, if you are building an app-based solution, right? So they, they kind of behave as the collector and they buffer the data and then reliably provide that data into your, into your real-time um, ingestion platforms. <clears throat> so once, now that like we, we kind of talked about a little bit about the ingest, once, once the data comes here, what next, right? So um, usually it tends to be either I kind of store the data or do some transformation and then store the data. So in this case, like we're gonna talk about some, some solutions that's out there or in services out there that, with which you can transform the real time data that is coming in. Um, topmost is Firehose, we talked about that, right? Um, so a typical use case that we see all the time is um, I get a, um, a streaming data. I, I wanna do some real time analytics on top of it, but I also want to store this reliably so that if something happens to my data, like you know, in flight, I should be able to go and play back that or use like a, a Lambda based architecture to recover the data or you know, fill in those gaps, right? So in those scenarios, you take the Kinesis data and pump it through Firehose and write it into S3 or something like that. And then you use, use another fan out um, stream to do your real time analytics. Um, it's, a, it's a popular pattern that we see. Um, so that's where 
you can integrate Firehose with Kinesis. Um, Kinesis Analytics um, is, is, a, is a serverless analytics platform it's, that comes in two varieties. One is um, a SQL-based uh, analytics that, that you can directly run on top of the data that's coming in. Uh, people who might be familiar with Kafka uh, SQLs, like, you know, this is very similar to Kafka SQL uh, pro, uh, provided by AWS. So, um, and, and it also provides a Flink-based solution where you can write uh, a Flink-based, like a streaming analytics code, and then deploy it on Kinesis Analytics in a serverless platform. Again, it's, it's highly scalable, um, it, it is resilient, it, you pay only f when you use it and how much you use it. So it's, it's really, really cool way to uh, handle uh, and a, a, a real-time data set that's coming on your way, right? Um, EMR, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. It's, it's been like, um, it's, a, it's a big data platform available on AWS. It's been there for 10 years. It's tried, tested uh, a pattern of, of uh, big data solutions like out in the out in the AWS ecosystem. So you can use that to process your Kinesis streams as well. Um, if you don't want any of that, so um, I want to like, you know, process the data as it comes in. I want to do something custom. Uh, you can use either Lambda or something like your uh, Kinesis client, li uh, client library to like ingest the data on your own and do whatever you wish, right? So that way like you can take it and pro process it as you see fit. Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, the next flavor of um, the real-time or streaming data ingestion tool, right, service that's available, right? So uh, very similar to um, Kinesis, but it's only a subset because um, this is a new service. Uh, AWS is yet to, like, build connectors for Firehose, uh, for Elasticsearch, and so forth. So for now, you, you can connect Kafka through Flink. Um, and run it in EMR or data analytics, or use Kafka clients and do what you wish, right? So, um, and Kinesis Firehose. Um, as, as I kind of mentioned earlier, this is um, a, a simplified version of streaming data ingestion, right? So uh, where I don't want to do any processing with my data. As soon as the data comes in, um, I just want to maybe do a minor transformation here and there, and then write the data as soon as possible into um, one of the destinations, right? So either it's S3, Redshift, or Elasticsearch. I want to just take the data and make it available there. Um, you know, uh, Kinesis Firehose is a great service for that. It is, it is very scalable. It's auto-scaling, meaning you don't have to provision how much you need it. So as in Ben, you know, you know pump in your data, you, you can auto-scale. So we have tested it with, um, like around a million records per second, right? That's around like 200 terabytes a day, right? Something like that. So um, it's, it's, it, it is capable of handling that kind of volume without you doing any, any effort. Like, you know, it's very turnkey. You switch it on, it's available for you. Um, so we kind of talked about how you transform and store it, but um, there's also this use case of real-time analytics. Um, which is really important because why else would I be handling streaming data, right? If, uh, if I'm going to do everything in, in, um, in batch mode, I'm just going to use Firehose and pump it into, into S3 and then use uh, batch-based tools to process it. But if I want to like truly um, do a real-time analytics, what do I mean by that? Let's say as soon as you're watching Netflix, right? So you watch a, a show or an episode as soon as you're done with it, it kind of gives you a recommendation of what you need to do next, right? So um, that, that event is actually captured in real time. Um, and based on that event, like Netflix is giving you a recommendation, right? That is happening in real time. So for now, for, you, for it to do that, uh, it has to capture the data that as it comes along. And within, like, you know, few, within few seconds, it should be able to give that recommendation. So uh, for that, uh, we use either use Kinesis Analytics or like EMR to directly tap into data, each one of those records as it comes in, and then you make decisions on top of it, right? In, in terms of Netflix example, uh, what they might do, I, I don't know how exactly they do it, but I'm just speculating here that uh, they would be having a, a real-time 
a sort of a SageMaker kind of an endpoint where you pass in the, the person's profile um, and they would have, using data science models, they would have built a, a recommendation for you and then they will, it'll immediately give you a response as to what you want to do with it, right? Um, so you do that analytics or in case of, let's say, a game where um, a bunch of players are playing a game, right? Um, and in real time, um, the, the, the people who built the game wants to understand how many people are playing in a particular game, right? Um, how many points they've scored, like, you know, how many kills that they made. So those kind of aggregations has to be made in near real time as the data comes in. And you can use, again, Kinesis Analytics and EMR to do those aggregations and push the data into uh, something like, you know, uh, a Firehose or Redshift or Elasticsearch where you can run real time analytics. So a uh, really powerful uh, set of tools that's available for you. Again, all of these is turnkey. These are serverless, meaning like you're not running any server on your own. Um, it is completely managed by AWS. You, you create it as you need it. You pay for it based on how small or big you have built it, right? Uh, or configured it. Um, so on top of, on top of the real-time analytics that you do, um, you also do like, you know, uh, a typical data and analytics, right? On the streaming data that is coming in. For, uh, I'll, I'll, if, you, if you wanna think about it, a little bit like a Lambda-based architecture, right? I get the data in real time, I process it, um, I make certain decisions out of it, but I also store it. I wanna do a near real-time analytics of that data. So how do you do that, right? Um, AWS provides a set of services um, spe revolving around um, you know, S3 and data, a Gloob data catalog. So as the data comes in, you store it, you catalog it, and through Redshift and through like, you know, tools like uh, Athena uh, and SageMaker and Spectrum, uh, the, uh, you can run analytics on the data as soon as it comes in. Like you're not waiting for a day or two uh, before this data is available. It's immediate, right? Uh, because the streaming data is written into S3 and it's cataloged on top of Glue which can be queried using Athena or, or um, something like Redshift Spectrum. Um, so again, powerful set of tools that allows you to query as soon as the data comes into the ecosystem. It can be combined with your dimensional data set, all the data sets that is coming from your uh, OLTP systems and like, you know, build um, results for your KPI, for your dashboards, for your data science needs and all of that. So really, really powerful set of um, services available for you. So um, just gonna talk about a quick reference architecture that we kind of like, you know, um, see where, where people are asking for um, uh, a streaming analytics or a Lambda-based architecture, right? So uh, the use case here is, um, you know, the uh, a system collects data in multiple regions uh, or multiple geographical locations. And as soon as this data is collected, uh, they want to bring it into a centralized location and then build um, a catalog on top of it, right? Uh, so that it can be queried um, both in real time and also in a batch-based mode for, for ad additional KPIs and dashboards. Um, so here you see, um, you know, you get a streaming data feed, uh, you do some real-time analytics, maybe you want to store that, that data on data lake and may not, uh, and then the raw data is stored as well. And then you do batch-based analytics and then push it to data lake, right? So finally, all the data is coming to a data lake where you could do um, a long-term analytics uh, or batch-based analytics on top. So that's, that was a conceptual view, but here is the like sort of a, a physical view, right? Using, using AWS's set of um, services, how can you build that solution out? Um, so at the top, you are looking at a, a central cloud region where um, we are depicting it as a streaming aggregator, but you can directly write it into streams if you, if you wish. But um, the idea is to have a reliable buffer through which like, you're pumping the data in, right? From, from your applications into Kinesis. Uh, once you have that on one side, like you know, we are storing the data as soon as possible into S3 with let's say a minute latency. And then like through Athena, it's, the data is queryable for you. Um, on the other side, through the same Kinesis streams, you tap and like, you, know, you get um, this 
a copy of the data and you do real-time analytics on top. Um, it could be aggregations, it could be other decisions, it could be recommendations, whatever it is. You know, so you, you can perform that on the analytics side of that um, you know, so, uh, house. And then you're using Lambda, you, like, you know, we're just saying that, okay, I want to push it into Redshift in, term, in case of aggregation so that uh, it's immediately available to your um, dashboarding tools or your reporting tools like Tableau or Looker, like, you know, whatever, whatever tool that, that your team may be using. On the top, you you can take the data that is uh, pushed into S3, and with the existing historical data that you already have in your in your tool set, uh, or in your in your S3 bucket or in, in Redshift, you can do enrichments, right? You can do aggregations, uh, you can do transformations, and build additional data set, and then again push it back into Redshift. So it's a really powerful architecture. All of this is serverless. Um, except for Redshift, Redshift is it's a it's, it's a managed service, but it's not truly serverless. Um, so that's for the, well, the central region, right? So now the the the, the application expands that that they want to um, deploy their their solution across the globe. How do I collect the data in other regions? So AWS provides a really simple way uh, to deploy a subset of that architecture into 18 different regions across the globe where you can kind of look at it nearby where you're running your business. For example, it may be EU, it may be Japan, it could be wherever, right? Create a subset of that solution and then like, you know, through CRR, CRR is called cross-region replication. So you don't have to do anything, just configure uh, the, the local data is automatically copied to your central region and then you perform additional analytics on top, right? So this is a pattern that, uh, that we see and it's very effective. Um, and again, very turnkey. You don't have to, it doesn't take months upon months for you to build. If you know what you're doing, it's, it's a matter of hours or days. Um, <clears throat> next. So I'm just going to give you a high level overview from a CI CD perspective, right? No matter what solution you build, um, the, today, in today's world, if you do not have a proper DevOps process, proper CI CD process, you cannot turn around really quick, right? Um, your, your, your turnaround time or your deployment time or your entire software lifecycle, release cycle time dramatically improves if you use like in a CI CD uh, and DevOps like approaches, right? Um, so because we are using all like managed services and um, serverless solutions, you can, you can deploy the entire solution as a code, right? Using either through um, cloud formation, which is part of Elbis's own um, uh, like service, which, which, allow, which is kind of a meta service. It's a service to run other services, right? Or you can use something like Terraform through which like you can um, orchestrate this, this entire platform and deploy it in multiple regions um, in, in a turnkey fashion. Um, so a typical like, you know, CI CD pipeline looks like this, right? Um, within AWS world, um, you, you have a code pipeline, which is sort of the centralized um, orchestration engine, which takes your infrastructure pieces and your code pieces and moves through the pipeline. Um, your code commit is where you may keep both your infrastructure code, which is again, uh, right, it, it's, it's a code, it's a configuration code, and then your application code in, uh, in code commit, and that could be built through code build and then deployed through cloud formation or Terraform or anything else that you wish. So um, again, think about CI CD um, when you're building a streaming analytics solution or any other solution for that matter. It's really important uh, that you, you think about it and you incorporate that, that as part of the um, de de development culture. So it's, it's really important. Um, monitoring, right? Um, Again, you, you built it, you deploy it, now you have to monitor it and support it, right? So um, all the services that we talked about um, collect metrics locally without you doing anything. For example, Kinesis um, kind of keeps, uh, keeps the metrics of how much data that is coming in, um, how much it is scaling out and scaling in, uh, whether there is back pressure, whether there, there are failures, all of those metrics is collected by default, right? Uh, it, and it is automatically published into uh, CloudWatch metrics. It's available to you, uh, tone key. Now, um, all you have to do is, based on what you need and what you want to um, 
like monitor upon, you can build like, you know, alarms and alerts on top of CloudWatch metrics and get the important updates that you need. That, so that you can keep the SLA, you can keep the, the, the support. Um, and it also provides something called dashboards where it gives you a single pane of glass. Um, let's say I'm, I'm building in, uh, an, a streaming pipeline and providing some analytics uh, dashboards to, to, uh, to my customer. Uh, there are like five or six services that are, that are stitched together to, to build a solution. You want to understand like if something, something goes wrong, some of the numbers are not looking right. You need a single plane of uh, glass to go and take a look at it and understand where something has gone wrong. So um, that is again provided as a dashboard service by, um, by CloudWatch. Um, you should definitely take a look at it. Um, from a security perspective, um, all of these services support encryption at, at rest and also at transmission. Uh, it integrates well with encryption services, something like um, KMS or Cloud HSM, uh, that allows you to encrypt your data when you, when you save it, and also gives you a, a really good control in terms of access uh, who, has, who can decrypt or encrypt that data, right? Um, it provides robust network security in terms of VPC endpoints uh, and, and VPC in general. So uh, definitely like, you know, take advantage of those. Um, on top of that, from a data governance perspective, who has access to what, both at the service level, at the data level, uh, IAM and SSO are the services that, that allows you to kind of dial that knob. Um, on top of that, most of these services are uh, FedRAMP and HIPAA and SOC compliant. So uh, you don't have to go through that audit process again. It's um, as long as you are doing what's, um, you know, being recommended as best practices, you should be in compliance. Last but not least, uh, the, the idea of well-architected framework, right? So this is something that AWS preaches um, to uh, all, of its, all of its customers. And now it, they are even like, you know, bringing it up as a separate service through their partners and through their professional services uh, arm. The idea is that uh, when you're building a solution on cloud, uh, there are best practices, best practices across all these five pillars, what, what they call it as pillars, right? Uh, that you have to, as, as, a, as, a, as a sponsor, or as, or as an engineer, as, as, a, as an executive, you have to understand that. So, you know, all these five pillars are taken care of when you build a solution. Um, and, and, and that helps you to build a, a secure, a cost-effective, a reliable and operationally efficient solution for you, right? Um, so it's re really important. Um, just go on, just read about it. Like, you know, they have a bunch of white papers that helps you to kind of bring up to speed. And especially when you're building a solution, you need to start there to understand what these uh, well-architected uh, framework recommendations are and build your solutions around that. Um, helps you, helps you uh, in, in the long, long run. So that's, that's it. That's all I have. Um, yes, questions? Say that again. So, okay, the, the question is, is the architecture optimal for Snowflake as well, instead of Redshift, yes. right? I believe so. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's Redshift or it's Snowflake or any other um, transactional system like Aurora, RDS, and whatnot. So yeah, it is, it is definitely useful. Um, you can ingest the data in real time into, into those platforms. Do you have any idea if, if there's a streaming service and we are using this architecture and we want to do the recommendation for the how long does it take? How many seconds or milliseconds? Um, from ingest into Snowflake? Or Yeah, so um, assuming that your model is built and it's already been serving, right? Um, we have seen somewhere around like in a 100 to 200 millisecond range is the recommendation. Like it's the latency, overall latency, like from uh, the system which is asking for it and like the recommendation is going through the pipeline and coming back. 
So we have seen something around like 200, 200 milliseconds. Can you show some numbers, like performance numbers uh, you have achieved uh, by following the reference architecture? Like how many transactions per second you achieved? So uh, the maximum we saw like uh, was around a million records per second. So that's around, um, I want to say around 180 terabytes per day uh, from an ingestion standpoint. So uh, from a Kinesis shards perspective, it's like around 1,000 shards. It's like one GBPS, right? Um, and rest of them is all like auto scaling. Uh, Redshift auto scales based on the based on the data, data, data that is coming in. Um, so the data and S3, it's, we are compressing it as Parquet and Snappy. So it's like 5x compressed. So if it's like 175 terabytes of raw data, um, after compression, it's like one fifth of that. So like my math, I don't know. I'm just I couldn't able to do my math. So it's something around uh, 30 to 40. Uh, so um, when it comes to Firehose, Firehose has direct like you know um, sync to to Elasticsearch. You don't have to do use some use something in between. Um, so, but if you are using something like Lambda, uh, then you have to build something on your own. So. So it is not the raw data that you're writing into Redshift, right? So you're aggregating it. So you're aggregating it based on a window. Usually real-time uh, aggregations are done based on a minute window or whatever window that you're setting up, right? Uh, it's not as much as you would think. Uh, it would be like something around a few hundred uh, calls per second, uh, I believe, so if, uh, on an average. It will be automatically hot if you're pumping in the day. <laughs> so, yeah. Um. So, when we have a streaming platform, the data goes, real time data goes in the segment, which is one, two. Yeah. So, um, it, I, I do not have a lot of experience with Snowflake, I just have a little bit. But I'm kind of, uh, Snowflake is synonymous to Redshift if, if, um, from a practical perspective. Um, if I, my, our recommendation is never take raw data into Redshift, right? So because the volume of data is gonna be high, especially at large scale. Um, so you, you dump it into something like S3 or at real time if you wanna perform certain aggregations, do those aggregations in real time and then push it into Redshift. Uh, or Snowflake, that makes a lot more sense um, because you're going to pay for the data that you're storing, right? And also, from a compute angle, you're computing across a large data set. Um, so if you can do the aggregations prior and then store the aggregations in something like Redshift or Snowflake, it makes more sense. Okay. All right, anything else? Cool. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Jay. That was a great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks.